and we'll also be getting some expert opinion from a former president of the Trade Union Congress, Comrade Peter Esele, who joins us virtually live from Lagos. It's good to see you, Comrade. Good for having me. Thank you so much indeed. Well, uh, I think it should begin virtually uh, before coming back to the studio. Um, comrade, you are the expert here. And over the years, I know you and I have engaged in conversation around subsidy, around availability of uh, petrol products. It does look like deja vu, isn't it? Because uh, there are some things that you will say and you imagine to yourself that it seems I've seen, I've said this thing some years back. How appalled are you by what we have, well, where we have found ourselves? Or what exactly, how do you assess the situation, Mr. Esele? Uh, well, I I'm going to speak to the fact uh, without emotions. First of all, let's look at what it costs to produce a liter of petrol. If you want to produce a liter of petrol, it's between 50 cents to 80 cents. And if you have to do that conversion, because all of this problem ties around the devaluation of our currency. And we all know that petrol, crude oil, they are all, tra they are all traded in dollars. So if it costs you between, let me just, let, let's use 50, 50 cents as an example. And then let's say dollar to Naira is about 1,600. So if you use 50 cents to produce a liter of uh, petrol, and then we look at it at 160. So what you have at the moment will be to cost about 800 naira to produce a liter of petrol. And then if you add the other uh, extra cost to it, you are going to have a landing cost taking you close to 1,000 naira. So that, first of all, is what we need to know that that's the, that's the bottom line to why we are going to be having incessant price increase. So now a barrel of crude is about $74. So if you also multiply that by 1,600, it gives you about 118,000 Naira per barrel. So what do you do to bring down the price? That means uh, you have to subsidize that price. You know, you and I have been talking about this over the years. And most times, I, I have always said, the people that are most scared of are uh, the economists, the lawyers, and the clergymen. Why am I saying about the economists? The economist tells you that we need to take away this subsidy. And then the country will become a Dorado. You and I know that is not possible. And then what you do in that instance is that when you now go ahead to start subsidizing it, economists will tell you that all things being equal. You and I know all things are never equal. There are certain factors and forces that are behind whatever we have to pay. So there is the political side of the economy. I call it the political economics of the economy. And then there is the economics of the economy. The economics of the economy cannot survive without the political economics of the economy. So what the federal government is trying to do is find that balance. And in finding that balance, life is also getting more difficult because there is no omnibus plan. By omnibus plan, I mean a synergy between the federal, the state, and the local government. So once we have all of that in place, it's going to be easy for people to move from one place to another. We all know that energy cost is the major pillar for inflation. Once you have a high energy cost, you are going to have inflation. So what we are going to face now, what we are facing right now is that we have a high energy cost, we have a devaluation of our currency, and we will, we have facing, the, it's like it's hydra headed. So devaluation, subsidy removal, and these are the challenges we are going to face. And hopefully, I, I think I'm more hopeful now that before the end of the year, the federal government and NPC refinery will also come on stream. So once we have availability, which means availability means uh, availability equals national energy security, which is very, very important. And then we cannot look at the fact that we're no longer importing, that relaxes pressure on our FX. And then take you another a step further is that it can also take away five to 10 naira of the pump price cost. Okay, now, for any reasonable person or any mature mind as far as these issues are concerned, you will know, and I'm saying maturity in the sense that you are able to um, take away emotions and also bring in your experience or, uh, yeah, your experience of how things operate in other climes. You look at the price in other climes 
They're similar, either neighboring countries or as far as the U.S. or the U.K., and you see how much of these uh, does this commodity, or in fact, in some other oil-producing countries, and you compare to us, you will discover that in the true sense of it, that we have enjoyed over the years a subsidized product given. Now, the fact that I, a lot of Nigerians find difficult to wrap their heads around is the manner in which the NMPCL has operated over the years. And in fact, what a lot of people will say, a, an unfair, an untransparent, and uh, well, I don't know how else to describe it because NMPCL, for example, will tell you that refinery will be ready. The dates have been shifted over several months. It's not yet ready. We do not know what kind of voodoo it takes to repair the refinery. On another hand, NPCL came over the weekend to tell Nigerians that, oh, we can no longer bear the burden. The presidency, true by Onunuga, said we were not lying and there's no uh, uncovering of anything. But anybody who knows will, will realize that there's no budget for subsidy. There is no provision of that in the PIA, but the fact remains that somebody is paying for that. But why does it look like Nigerians have been thrown in the dark for far too long, Mr. Esele? Yeah, one of the challenge is, I would say, poor governance structure. So once you have poor governance structure, no matter how brilliant your ideas are, they are never going to work. Now, over the years, we have always been hearing about turnaround maintenance. I will tell you, this is the first time NMPC is actually doing what I call a proper turnaround maintenance. And then you know how Nigerian politicians work. They call Federal Executive Council and they tell you, we are going to do turnaround maintenance. At $3 billion have been, have been projected for, the, for that project to do turnaround maintenance. At the end of the day, they only approve, just like the Lagos Ibada Express Road, you know it has taken almost two decades to... To, to complete. And then you find out that at the turnaround maintenance they do, government goes ahead, release maybe $50 million, and they don't release any more fund. So for 20 years, one of the reasons why I told you earlier that I'm very optimistic that this refinery will come on stream is because this money is borrowed, is warehoused, and the payments are made according to milestones. What are the challenges an NPC are facing? You have a refinery that has not worked for about 20 years or more. And then they, 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 right now they are going through some testing going on and suddenly they discover another problem and they have to fix it. So they are having some challenges, but that's why I can say, yes, I'm more hopeful that this is going to come on based on what is happening there. And also based on the report, I'm also getting about what is happening in that refinery. And then the other aspect is that you look at an NPC. It doesn't matter which party is in power. It doesn't matter. We had Obasanjo was in power from 1999. Uh, we had Obasanjo was there for eight years. You have Vera Dua, you have Jonathan, that was PDP administration. Now you have APC. So it has to do with the governor's structure. Is that you find out that at the time of Obasanjo was also our president, he was also the minister for petroleum. We also had that with uh, Buhari. Now we also have it now. And you start asking yourself, the president is too busy and he will not have time for all of that. So the first thing we need to do is first, let's look at the governor's structure. And you also made reference to other clients. If you are a worker and you are asked to pay 50% of your salary as taxes, you gladly pay when you know your children can benefit from free quality education and your transportation system is heavily subsidized, education, same. Now, that's why I keep referring to the omnibus plan. Our attention majorly in Nigeria is always on the federal government. We are not asking about what is the state government doing with their revenue. The devaluation have also substantially benefited the state government because what they get this money from is that they had to, they get it from FAC, it's in dollars, the conversion had to be done. And so the state governors get more money. Nobody is asking the state government, it's not responsible of federal government to provide local transportation. I live in Lagos, for example. It's not responsible of federal government to provide transportation for me to move from where I am to, this, to any other point. So we, that is why I keep emphasizing the Omebos plan. So from the technical aspect that I've spoken to you about, I'm very optimistic that that is going to come on. NMPC is going to have competition. Then go to the final is coming on. In another two years, we are going to have BOA also coming on stream. So the future for our energy availability and also to be able to take over the provide energy for the entire West African coast is bright. I'm hopeful. But what I expect government to do before Nigerians get to that point is that they have to stay alive first is that there must be a plan between the federal, the state, and the local government on how to mitigate the various challenges facing the ordinary Nigerians. Now, the question is, 
Good news, isn't it? Uh, and you will tell us whether it is or not. Uh, in the Dangote emergence into the, into the realm, how much of joy can we express in the fact that now within the private sector, we've got a refinery that is that big? First, before I go to your answer, I want to go back to what, you, what he was talking about. I, I told you I wasn't going to be emotive and uh, I wasn't going to talk, talk like a politician. First thing he said, uh, a crude of a barrel, a barrel has 159 liters, but he didn't tell you, he didn't tell you how much it will cost to produce a liter of petrol. So we have to stay on facts. If we want to be emotional, yes, I, I, I have been a labor leader, so I understand that. So you can be emotive without giving up facts. So one of the reasons why you asked me to come here was, let's speak to the facts. First, is Nigeria, is this where we think Nigeria should be? The answer is no. The answer is no. We should have energy self-sufficiency. So I now come to your issue of Dangote Refinery. Dangote Refinery is good news. It's good news. The good news is that we're going to have energy availability. The other side of it is that are we going to pay international market price because crude oil is priced in the dollar. The government says it's going to sell, sell the crude oil to Dangote in Naira. But how are they going to price that Naira? Would that Naira be priced in dollars? If it's priced in dollars, then what I have told you is actually what it will cost to produce a liter of petrol. That's on one hand. On the other hand, Dangote had said it himself that the price of how much is going to be paid will be fixed by the president and the federal executive council, which invariably means that is not going to be driven by demand and supply, and it's not going to be driven by market forces. So subsidy is going to come in through the back door. And we've had series of language around subsidy. There is subsidy and there is subsidy. You know, the PDP chieftain make refer made reference to how much it was 2014. But I'll take you back. In 2010, it was 148 Naira to the dollar. How much were we paying before then for a liter of petrol? So what you've had is that there have been gradual increments and over time, when I was president of TUC and Penderson, our suggestion to the government was, let's do a 10% or a 20% yearly increase. The government had challenge. The challenge they had was that people were abusing the subsidy. So if you go ahead and you abuse subsidy, and that is why we also had these challenges, this poor hack we've had recently, it was not only a challenge of uh, a, a product not being available, it was also product leaving the country. You know, and, and this is something we are not looking at. It's very easy for us to blame everybody. It's very easy for us to blame the government. You cannot get out a truckload of petrol out of Nigeria without the connivance of security agencies. It's not possible. So we also need to look at ourselves and say, are we sincere to ourselves? Do we love ourselves? And then the other aspect is that why would a truck leave Nigeria without being tracked? I can track my car. Every truck in Nigeria can be tracked. But the fact is that nobody wants technology in the mix because technology will annihilate corruption from the system. So these are things that we also need to look at ourselves. Politicians are masters of being emotions, of throwing words around, but we need to ask ourselves, what have all of this done? We've had, we've had democratic dispensation from 1999 to date. Obasanjo was there for eight years. No refineries worked. Eradua was there for a couple of years. None of our refineries worked. Jonathan was there. None of our refineries worked. No refineries have been working. And Dangote is building his own. Dangote is, is coming up on stream. Probably that is what is also pushing an NPC that, making, that is making an NPC say, okay, fine, September, it will come on stream. I don't think it will be happening in September. My take is that it will come in towards the ending of this year. That is my take about what is going yes, to happen. That, so that, we're going to have I don't know you to be a bearer of bad news. Uh, Dave said it's no, going no, to come. I'm, I'm, uh, I mean, we, I'm, we I'm, need... I'm, we need all to call out NMPCL if that refinery does not come on stream in September. Either they are not going to sleep until the end of September, that refinery should come up in September because they've kept, they Chewa, kept shifting the goalpost. So I would gladly take you out for a dinner if, if I would be very happy if it come on stream in September. I will be very happy and I would, I would call you that we should have a dinner. But my take is that I don't, I just don't want, I don't want to, it's not bearing bad news. It's just don't, don't take people's hope. I prefer to, 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 to speak below what is going to happen than to over, than to take it more than is necessary. You know, NMPC have told us, you and I have had even informal conversation. It was first, it was going to happen in January. I thought it was not going to happen. Then later it was going to be in the second quarter. And here we are. 
So for me, my calculation is for the sake of my mental health and those around me, is I just said, why don't you just fix your mind towards November, December? But if it happened in September or September ending, I'm going to be very happy and I will send flowers to LMPC. But there are also fundamental challenges that goes with all of this. You know, you know, you know one thing that bothers me, uh, Mr. Esale, is that, that when people say that we're, we're a country where nothing happens, even when the worst situation happens to us, and I yes. hate, I hate to hear it, that we are, we are yes. just a people who do not care uh, when no consequences for, uh, for, for people's bad behavior, especially when they have answers to give to the Nigerian people. It's sad, so if, it? if NMPC is telling us now that they are subsidizing PMS to the tune of $6 billion, so that, and the federal government says there is no subsidy. So for NMPC to do that as a private entity, that invariably tells you that there's poor governance structure, poor corporate governance. For you to owe, for you to 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 have it to owe a debt of up to six billion dollars, then there's poor corporate governance. But but we keep talking as if we are from Mars, and that's one thing I've learned over over decade of my existence as a Nigerian. Nothing works if you don't have a process, you don't have a system, you don't have the right culture, you don't have the right value. It's not going to work. Society is not driven by personality. Society is driven by culture and value. And I'm sorry to say this, none of the political parties in Nigeria right now have culture, neither do they have values. You don't know what they stand for. Mr. Sala, uh, you are the expert here, just briefly, because yes. I have one more question to ask you. And my biggest fear is when Labour reacts to all of this. But before you react to that statement, because NLC said, we feel betrayed, and they gave their reasons. But before that, in terms of pricing, I imagine that when there is availability and uh, when there is no trans transportation cost and operational, I mean, transportation cost is being removed from the equation, especially the importation of crude, when we imagine that it will impact directly on the price of product locally uh, in terms of the retailing. But AGO has been produced from the Dangote refinery, but the prices or the price of AGO is still the same. Is there a reason for that? Because it, it, I'm, what, I'm worried and I'm afraid when Mr. Dangote said that he's waiting for the president and the federal government to determine the price yes. of petrol. And I'm imagining you are a private sector man. Uh, why is it that the government has to determine the price anyways when he's the one is paying for the crude and he's going to be operating as a private citizen? Because there's so many things that is underneath what we're looking at. So it, it, that, that invariably tells you when I talk about system, process, culture, and value. The foundation of any society is culture and value. So for a private sector to say he's waiting for the president to fix a price, that tells you that the value of free enterprise, the value, the, the culture of free enterprise, the culture of uh, market force economy is also being eroded. So that's one. So we must always factor that in, that we don't have a system. Somebody wakes up and tells you this is what's going to happen. And for this country to move forward, there must be respect. We must have culture, we must have value, and from that we'll have respect for rule of law. Once there is no rule of law, forget it. We're just, we will keep on moving, motion without movement. And then you talked about labor going to react. Of course, labor will react. But again, I also expect labor to have anticipated this. You know, labor should have anticipated this. I, I will not expect... Uh, Osifo to immediately issue a statement or Pengasi to issue a statement. This would have been anticipated. And I've always emphasized the need. It's not only talking about wages that we put at the end of the month. We must be able to look at what we do. If you tell somebody you want to pay him 200,000 naira as minimum wage, inflation is going to gallop the whole thing. What we need to do is health care, transportation. You subsidize all of that. There are so many ways we can get around this. But I don't want to talk like a politician. And they come up and nobody's offering how to get Nigeria out of our current situation. That's a fundamental challenge that we are facing right now. Everybody is being emotive, but that's not what I'm looking at. Mr. Peter Esela, thank you so much indeed for you've reacted and uh, you've dealt with the labor side of things. I have fear when labor decide to weigh in on this matter, uh, it could be harsher and it could be very fierce. But thank you so much indeed for your time tonight. Mr. Peter Esela, who is a former president of the Trade Union Congress. <laughs>